Throughout the ages, there have been great empires and civilizations that have risen up, their creators ruling nations, regions and continents for hundreds, even thousands of years. Some of the great legacies and accomplishments of these empires may be lost in the mists of time, but from what they have left behind in rock and ruin, we can trace remarkable stories. The Roman Empire was the most powerful economic, cultural, political and military force in the world of its time. And it was one of the largest empires in world history. At its height under Emperor Trajan, it covered three million square miles. For 500 years, the city of Rome was the largest city in the world. We walk around Rome today and everywhere you turn, there is something awesome to see. The longevity and vast extent of the empire, ruled for almost a thousand years from Rome, ensured the lasting influence of Latin and Greek language, culture, religion, inventions, architecture, philosophy, law, and forms of government on the empire's descendants. If we're talking about the whole of the empire, the eastern half of the empire as well. We're talking well over 2,000 years. So the longevity of empire was, was massive. Their legacy is seen by the sheer number of different people who have used their imagery to establish and legitimize their own empire. Our story begins not in an ancient Roman city, but a Greek one. The Greeks had already established colonies in Italy, notably in Sicily, but also here in Pestum, south of Naples. Rome stole, borrowed, adapted and innovated many elements of Greek culture. But it was their engineering and design skills and a fearsome military tradition that distinguished them. What the Romans did is take existing structures and adapt them, and they would try to find how they could use their Roman architecture to fit in and allied with the existing traditions, thus these kind of long porticos and long streets that then functioned as markets in the city. Initially, scholars often said that Romans just copied the Greek architecture, they had similar types of buildings. But when you look closely at Roman architecture, you can really see the extent to which Romans have taken an idea and done something completely different with it. The arch is a quintessentially Roman piece of architecture. The Romans wanted to be able to create the vision of space, and they liked to be able to control space and the arch allows you to create the illusion of a higher sky, and it also shapes your field of vision. The Appian Way was one of the earliest and strategically most important Roman roads of the ancient Republic. It connected Rome to Brindisi in southeast Italy. It was known as Appia Long Aram Regina Viral. The Appian Way, Queen of the Long Roads. They're a brilliant example of the Romans' yes we can strategy in that the Romans wanted their straight roads and they would plow through mountain sides, they would go through anywhere and they would do whatever was necessary to build their straight roads. It's a real testament to the Romans' commitment to an empire. It wasn't just about conquest and conquering a city, but Really, to rule that city, you need to set out infrastructure. 
Throughout its history, it was engineering skills that built Rome, but it was also their use of slaves. One in three citizens of Rome were slaves, and the Appian Way is remembered for the crucifixion of 6,000 slaves along its 80-mile route between Rome and Capua, after a slave revolt led by Spartacus in 73 BC. There were more slaves than people in terms of the Roman mindset. They were tools with human voices. That is how they were perceived, because they weren't perceived to be people. You wouldn't make a census of them. The Roman Empire began around 400 BC as the Roman Republic, after the overthrow of the Etruscans, who had ruled parts of the Italian peninsula, and in the Punic Wars, the Carthaginians, who had controlled the Western Mediterranean from their capital in North Africa. Then, after the coming of Julius Caesar, and then the birth of Imperial Rome, it expanded dramatically eventually holding sway over an estimated 70 million people. At that time, 21% of the world's entire population. Controlling large territorial holdings around the Mediterranean Sea in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Then, in its final phase, after the sacking of Rome in the 5th century, it lived on as the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantium Empire, for another thousand years, until its final collapse in the 15th century. The 400-year-old Roman Republic was transformed with the arrival of the brilliant general Julius Caesar. In 52 BC, Caesar defeated the Gallic tribes, the Gauls, in a battle of Elysia situated in Burgundy in modern-day France. The site is marked today by a monument to the Gauls' leader, Vercingetorix of the Averni, who lost the battle to the Roman general. It would be a pivotal battle for Caesar and for Rome. Not only was it militarily really important for Caesar, it gave him a massive victory. He got 20 days of thanksgiving from the Roman Senate because of this huge success. Alesia was a fortified settlement on a lofty hill with rivers running on each side. Due to such strong defensive features, Caesar decided upon a siege to force surrender by starvation. About 80,000 men were garrisoned in Alesia together with the local civilian population. To guarantee a perfect blockade, Caesar ordered the construction of an encircling set of fortifications, a circumvallation around Elysia. It was made of earth and wood and was 12 foot high, with 24 towers running almost 10 miles. Caesar then further prepared his fortifications to defend against an attack from the rear by other Gallic tribes constructing another even longer 13 and a half mile wall. Outside both the outer and inner walls, Caesar dug ditches and random holes, filled with sharp stakes and water to impale and trap the enemy. With the inhabitants of Elysia starving, the Gaulish leader, Virchard Getterix, released women, children, the elderly and ill from their hilltop fortress. But Caesar allowed them to starve in no man's land. The Gauls then attacked from both sides, but were routed. And that was another way of Caesar lowering the morale of the Gauls. It's brilliant, horrid, cruel, but absolutely genius. Basically, the siege was incredibly innovative. So Caesar understood that Vercingetorix had sent for reinforcements. So Caesar ended up preparing for himself to be besieged as much as for himself to lay siege to the Gauls. It was not an easy win. Many, many Romans died. But of course, the reason why it's so famous is it comes back to the fact that Julius Caesar wrote about it in his work, The Gallic Wars, and tells us how amazingly important it was. 
Caesar was finally assassinated here in the Roman Forum in 44 BC. He was murdered. And actually, that's a way to make a name for yourself. Sounds awful, but he was murdered in a really violent way. You know, he was stabbed to death by many men. And, of course, Shakespeare wrote about him as well. So, you know, that, uh, that provides another aspect of his longevity. The teeming heart of ancient Rome, it's been called the most celebrated meeting place in the world and in all history. It was here that Caesar was cremated too, and Mark Antony gave his famous oration at the funeral, and two years later displayed the head of his enemy, Cicero. Located in the small valley between the Palatine and Capitoline hills, many of the oldest and most important structures of the ancient city were located on or near the Forum. A forum was the main centre of Roman cities. It served as a public area in which commercial, religious, economic, political, legal and social activities occurred. They were common in all Roman cities, but none were as grand as the Fora of Rome itself. The Forum was similar to a Greek agora, a public gathering place but with the use of extensive porticos. Whilst an agora was maintained as an open public place in a Greek city, Roman Fora developed into much more, with greater purpose and use, filled with shops, temples, offices and triumphal arches. They were the venue for important civic and political announcements, in addition to the less tasteful aspects of Roman life, such as prostitution. Over the years, the Fora of Rome became quite enclosed and probably very crowded and chaotic. The Forum today is a sprawling ruin of architectural fragments and intermittent archaeological excavations, attracting four and a half million sightseers yearly. After Caesar's assassination, Mark Antony, who was his co-consul and his grandnephew Octavian, pursued the conspirators and ruled jointly until Mark Antony formed a relationship with Egypt's queen, Cleopatra rejecting Octavian's system. Octavian declared war on Mark Antony and Cleopatra. The pair committed suicide. And Octavian returned to Rome triumphant, declaring himself Augustus, the revered one. He became emperor after the murder of his adoptive father, Caesar. His father had been murdered because he did look too much like a king. And that's what Rome hated. So Augustus knew whatever he did, he had to be incredibly careful. Actually, it is a huge feat that he died in his bed at the age of 76. You know, that is an amazing achievement. Augustus rebuilt Rome replacing brick with marble, and created a bureaucracy to run it. His rule of 41 years established the tone of the empire for a further 200, an era of relative peace and prosperity known as Pax Romana. Augustus is famous for saying, I transform Rome from a city of brick to a city of marble. And we often just think white marble, because in a modern context, we use white marble all the time, and we think this is what the Roman world looked like. But in a modern context, color is everywhere. I don't think we value it in the same way, whereas in the ancient world, color represented wealth. The purple stripe of a senatorial robe was an expensive dye that you had. So all these different marble colors were used to convey how wide the emperor was. How did a Roman understand? Because even the building materials were from a different place. All the best things in the Mediterranean world were owned by Rome. So all the best quarries, the nicest marble, the most unusual coloured marble, were usually possessed 
literally by the emperor, and only the emperor got to decide where that coloured marble was going to be used. Augustus, by 15 AD, had overseen the expansion of Rome from its Italian heartland. This was an empire based on power and conquest. Military successes were paraded through the streets of Rome. You know, if, you won a if you killed 5,000 of the enemy, then you would be eligible, you would be able to possibly be given a triumph. Conquest was an intrinsic part of Roman elite values, that in order to be anyone in Rome, you had to be a successful military general. So the epitome of an elite senatorial career was to become consul and then to go on campaign and to beat people up and come back and celebrate a triumph. Many Roman monuments that survive today celebrate these triumphs. Augustus was the first to pillage iconic treasures from ancient Egypt after his conquests there, establishing a trend of looting obelisks, a pattern followed by later emperors. And even empires nearly 2,000 years later, like those of France and Britain. The Romans wanted to go to Egypt to visit the pyramids. So just like modern tourists do today, the Romans would go to ancient Egypt to see the remnants of Pharaonic Egypt. They were very much aware that obelisks represented one of the great kingdoms of the past. After the pharaohs gave way to the Ptolemies of Egypt, the Ptolemies also were regarded as one of the great Hellenistic dynasties of their time. Notoriously, it's with the death of Cleopatra, the last of the Ptolemies, that then we see the end of Egypt as a separate kingdom. So what better way to show that you had Egypt under your thumb than by bringing back some of its ancient monuments and putting them up in Rome in different contexts? These obelisks are huge, they are heavy, they are unwieldy. To get them back from Egypt, they had to build obelisk boats to transport them over land to where they were going to be set up in Rome. And then they had to be erected. It's a very clever way of showing control over others, but also the ability to almost control the environment. The Roman people could see he had brought something of Egypt and Egyptian power, but we used it in showing how Egypt was now just a part, just a cog in the Roman machine of empire. They're set up 20 years after his victory at Actium in 10 BC, and what they really represent is how Egypt has been redacted, it's been led back to the Roman people. But we've not just stuck them somewhere, we've even then still used them for a functional purpose within a larger Roman sphere. On a hilltop overlooking the town of La Turbi, above modern-day Monaco, stands a monument to the Roman victory over the 45 separate tribes of the Alps. It proclaims the power and protection afforded by Rome and its god-emperor, Augustus. This trophy has only six of its 24 columns standing. It was originally 50 meters high, with a giant statue of Augustus on top. Augustus was celebrated across the empire as it expanded through France and into Spain. As far as the city of Mirida, which was founded by Augustus and became the capital city of Lusitania, its most far western province in Europe. Merida has the most impressive Roman theatre outside Italy. 
According to an inscription above an entryway to the theater, it was built in 16 BC by order of Agrippa, who was Augustus's son-in-law. It could house up to 6,000 spectators. In later centuries, the theater underwent several restorations, which introduced new architectural elements and decorations. The structure was restored to the current state in the 1960s and 70s. Much of the architectural influence on the Romans came from the Greeks. However, Roman engineering innovations meant theaters were built on their own foundations, instead of earthenworks or into a hillside, and were completely enclosed on all sides. There were design similarities between theaters and the much larger amphitheaters, which featured races and gladiatorial events. However, theaters with their semicircular form enhanced the natural acoustics for the plays, pantomimes, choral events, and orations that were performed here. A high back wall behind the stage floor was often supported by columns and ornately decorated niches. Another wall supported the front edge of the stage or podium. The auditorium itself was divided into a hollowed out space for the orchestra at the front and the seating section where stacked seating was provided in the tradition of the Greek theater. Different classes of people sat in different areas of the auditorium, with senators and the wealthy sat near the actors at the front and the less well-off higher up and further away. Merida today is full of Roman riches. The bridge over the river was built between 98 to 117 AD and is 900 yards long with 90 granite arches. It's one of the longest bridges the Romans ever built. They used it to travel further south to Andalusia and to Portugal. Merida, or Emerida Augusta as it was known, was modeled on many Roman cities. Its Circus Maximus, where chariot races took place, is one of the best preserved anywhere. An example of how the Romans took chariot racing to a whole new level. The Circus Maximus was designed specifically for chariot races. These massive arenas were oblong in shape with a long barrier, known as a spina running down the middle, containing statues and monuments. The Circus Maximus was more than 2,000 feet long and 400 feet wide. Its circumference could be up to a mile. Up to 12 chariots raced in this arena, and the most dangerous parts of the track were the two bends around the ends of the spina, where the chariots often collided or overturned. The stadium was surrounded by rows of seats all around, three stories high. The lowest seats were made of stone and the highest of wood. Permanent viewing stands incorporated private boxes for the VIPs, giving the Circus Maximus a capacity in the region of 250,000 spectators. The Circus Maximus was meant to be a place where you could sit wherever you wanted, regardless of where you were. Um, and the poet Ovid even wrote how this was a great place to go and pick up young women. Um, and he actually gives advice about how you should go up to a young lady, sit down next to her, ask her who she supports. Oh, you support that person too. Isn't that amazing? Oh, she's got a bit of dirt on her toga. Why don't you wipe it off? Oh, are these kind of wooden seats bothering your back? Let me just put my arm around you. And it, it's amazing because it could be a pickup guide for how you would collect a young lady uh, at a modern kind of football match or sporting event. In Merida, as in many Roman cities, the Romans built aqueducts to bring water to the city. And a forum or central square overseen by a magnificent temple to worship imperial cults. This one is thought to be a temple dedicated to Diana.
Maison Carrie was built between 2 and 5 AD, when Augustus had a number of public buildings constructed in the colonies of Gaul to promote their development. This is an example of monumental Roman religious architecture. Built on a platform dominating the public square, its outlines are similar to the Temple of Apollo in Rome. Its facade contains six columns with 11 further embedded columns on its sides. Its outline is simple. A colonnade gives access to the cult chamber. This housed a statue of the divinity and was only accessible by priests. The Temple of Bacchus at Baalbek in Lebanon, a World Heritage Site, is one of the best preserved and grandest Roman temple ruins in the world. It and its ornamentation served as an influential model for neoclassical architecture. It's thought the temple was commissioned later by Roman Emperor Antanas Pius, and the period of construction is generally considered to be between 150 AD and 250 AD. When the temple complex fell into disrepair, the Temple of Bacchus was protected by the rubble of the rest of the site's ruins. The temple is slightly smaller than the Temple of Jupiter and is 200 foot long, 110 foot wide and 100 foot high. Its walls are adorned by 42 unfluted Corinthian columns, 19 of which remain upright in position, standing 60 feet high. The key to architectural innovation in the Roman world is concrete. The ingredients that the Greeks lacked that the Romans had was called pozzolana, which was volcanic material from the area of the Bay of Naples. And the Romans discovered that they could create this amazingly strong material using aggregates to create innovative forms of architecture like domes, like aqueducts. Temple architecture provided an outlet for Roman artistic expression, revealed in such places as Pompeii, famously destroyed but preserved by the volcanic eruption of nearby Vesuvius in 79 AD. Its excavation has provided an extraordinarily detailed insight through frescoes in particular to the life of people living 2,000 years ago. After the death of Augustus, Rome's imperial dynasty entered a turbulent period. The underachieving Tiberius, who retreated to Capri, the hated Caligula, who was assassinated, Claudius, who was poisoned, and Nero, who killed himself. Nero is remembered as one of Rome's most hated figures for the persecution of Christians notably the gruesome killing of the Christian apostles Paul and Peter, and the slaughter of countless others, often by setting them alight as human torches in public places. But after Nero was forced to commit suicide, one of the things that the next dynasty of emperors did, so the Flavians, was that they actually dismantled a lot of Nero's buildings. Essentially, he took over the whole of the centre of Rome and made it into a grand pleasure garden for himself. And it was one of the things that the Flavians then wanted to do, which was to take back that space and give it back to the Roman people. Now, one way in which to engineer support was by the building of the Colosseum, by the giving of this gift of circuses of spectacular entertainment to the people of Rome. The construction of the amphitheater was started by Emperor Vespasian in 72 AD and was finished by his son Titus in 80 AD. During the Colosseum's opening ceremonies, spectacles were held for a hundred days in which 5,000 animals and 2,000 gladiators were killed. These animals were being brought in from the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire. So there was the element of exoticism, there was the way of displaying power to the people, and there was a way of giving everyone a free holiday. Now, 
what's not to like. People are going to love the fact that they get more free holidays and they can go and really enjoy themselves on a day out here. Fun, fun, fun for all the family. Go and see people being killed. Maybe not quite what we would think nowadays, but nevertheless, that was the Romans' idea of a good day out. The Colosseum could hold up to 80,000 spectators and, with an average audience of some 65,000, was used for gladiatorial contests and public spectacles, such as executions, classical mythology, drama, or the reenactment of famous battles upon both land and sea. Unlike earlier Greek theatres that were built into hillsides, the Colosseum is an entirely freestanding structure, deriving its basic structure from two Roman theatres standing back to back. The outer wall is estimated to have required over three and a half million cubic feet of travertine stone, which were set without mortar. They were held together by 300 tons of iron clamps. The ordered beauty and formal regularity of the Colosseum's exterior is created by three stories of superimposed arches filled with painted statues of emperors and gods. Columns on each story climb the walls, Tuscan, Ionic and Corinthian. The fourth higher blind story is punctuated by pilasters. Above the top, there was a huge awning, which was supported by 240 wooden poles, which could be drawn across with ropes to keep the sun off the audience, and 100 sailors, used to climbing high masts, were always in attendance to carry out this task. The public would enter through one of 78 entrances, with the two grandest entrances reserved for emperors, official presenters of the shows, and other grandees. Two final entrances were set aside for the gladiators. A lot of the Greeks would build their theatres into a pre-existing hillside. That gave the building structural solidarity, but it was also because they didn't have the arches. And in one way, when you look at the Colosseum, this massive building with at least three levels of arches, it is almost itself a massive continuing victory arch in terms of the way that it's laid out. In the Greek world, in a Greek theater, there were two main entrances to the building and everyone came through those two entrances. What the architecture and the arch and the barrel arches allow us to do is create separate spaces for people to go. And it reinforced that social hierarchy and social organization as well, because you didn't mix with different people. You went in your particular entrance to go to the Colosseum. So it was another way of solidifying um, Augustus's law, the Lex um, Julia Theatralis, which said people needed to sit in, of different classes needed to sit in particular areas. The Romans constructed amphitheatres across their empire, in North Africa, in the modern-day city of Tunis, in France, in Arles, and in its neighbour, the city of Nîmes. The Nîmes Arena is one of the best preserved, holding 24,000 spectators. Its major use was gladiatorial combat. The Romans built dozens of amphitheatres across their empire, including this one in western Spain, in Merida, and others in Italy itself, such as this amphitheatre in Verona. Augustus may have begun the practice of looting Egypt of its obelisks, but the Romans also introduced a victory arch to the world. The Arch of Titus in Rome was constructed in 82 AD by the Emperor Domitian, shortly after the death of his older brother Titus, son of Vespasian, to commemorate Titus' sacking of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Where these arches were set up is crucial. They're set up initially along the Roman victory procession. So you would leave the city, you would have a victory. And no one within the city of Rome necessarily would have witnessed what 
you had done. And so the purpose of the victory procession is that you're given the fast gaze, you're given this power to fight abroad and kill, and you come back and you bring all your spoils. So your spoils are the way that the Roman people can judge and see what you've done. Now, one problem with a victory procession is we all know, even in a modern context, parades can go horrifically wrong. You can't control the weather, and you certainly can't control the way that a crowd reacts on a certain day. Um, and ultimately, your day of a victory procession is just a day, and that soon gets lost in public consciousness. So what Victor started doing was trying to find a way to permanently monumentalize their victory and what they had done, and by doing so, permanently situate it on the victory procession in Rome so that every subsequent victory procession, you would see and you would remember their victory as a kind of permanent monument. The Arch of Titus provided the general model for many of the triumphal arches to follow, such as the Arch of Septimus Severus, commemorating the victory over the Parthians, and the Arch of Constantine, opposite the Colosseum. In later centuries, European powers again copied this great Roman symbol of conquest, including the Arc de Triomphe, erected by Napoleon to glorify his victories. After the reign of Titus, Rome entered a period known for its governance by the five good emperors, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius and Marcus Aurelius, were all educated men, devoted to their duties, respected by their people for running the empire well and defending its borders. Throughout the empire, other great sites left behind include the villas of the Roman emperors, such as those found on the Palatine Hill. Hadrian ended up claiming much of the credit for many building projects in this period. Hadrian's Wall was built to protect the colony of Britannia from the tribes in Scotland. Seventy-three miles of wall garrisoned by 9,000 soldiers. Construction started in 122 AD, following a visit by Hadrian, and was largely completed within six years. The mausoleum of Hadrian, now the Castel Sant'Angelo, is a towering cylindrical building in Rome, initially commissioned by Hadrian for himself and his family. The remains of succeeding emperors were also placed here. Hadrian also claimed credit for the rebuilding of arguably Rome's most famous building. The original building of the Pantheon was built by Agrippa, Augustus's right-hand man. On the Pantheon today, it actually says this was built by Agrippa. But the Pantheon we see today wasn't. It was built by Hadrian. The Pantheon is a remarkable and awe-inspiring building fronted by a huge rectangular entrance port with granite columns. The entrance leads to a wide circular chamber, or rotunda, capped with a massive dome. There are no windows in the Pantheon, and the only light is provided by a circular opening, or oculus, in the top of the dome. And in wet weather, rain pours through the center opening and runs away through drains installed in the floor of the building. The building's height of 141 feet is exactly equal to its diameter. Almost 2,000 years after it was built, the Pantheon's dome is still the world's largest unreinforced concrete dome, and the walls supporting it are up to 19 feet thick. The Pantheon was unique in Roman architecture. Nevertheless, it became a standard exemplar when classical styles were revived and has been copied many times by later architects. It is one of the best preserved of all ancient Roman buildings, in part because it's been in continuous use throughout its history. And since the seventh century, it's been used as a church. 
The Pantheon is visited by over six million people every year. One thing when I think of the Romans, it's their ability to control space, control nature, to control light, to control water, to operate even against gravity, to make you see things the way that they want to see things and control your viewpoint. And as you go through and you look at not only the architecture, but the actual buildings and the function of the buildings they create and what you're doing, that stream of consciousness of trying to control nature uh, runs through everything. The Romans directed their architectural skill not just at monuments and symbols of conquest, but also towards civic functions, including bridges and, notably, aqueducts. The aqueduct, known as the Pont du Gras near Nîmes in southern France, was the highest bridge ever built by the Romans. That bridge was built without use of mortar, and it is still standing. Yes, the stone in many places is sort of rough. When you go close to it, it doesn't look beautifully neat, but it is still an immense achievement of Roman engineering. It's almost 200 feet high, and almost a thousand feet long. It's made of three tiers of six, eleven, and thirty-four arches. Its architectural audacity and aesthetic made this one of Rome's greatest imperial statements, one of its great stone flags. It was originally part of a 31-mile long canal, supplying fresh water to the Roman city of Nîmes. The aqueduct stones, some of which weigh up to six tons, were precisely cut to fit perfectly together. It took 15 years to build and carried water for another 150. From the Middle Ages to the 18th century, the aqueduct was used as a conventional bridge to facilitate foot traffic across the river. Today, outside Rome, the ruins of another giant aqueduct snakes its way through the countryside. Its function, to supply water to the Roman capital, just beyond these giant ancient walls. Some of this precious water was delivered here to the baths of Caracalla. Roman public baths, or thermi, built between AD 212 and 216, during the reign of the emperor Caracalla. The complex of buildings was more a leisure center than just a series of baths. Besides being able to hold an estimated 1,600 bathers, it also featured a public library and a wrestling school. Bathing culture became important, and actually, as bathing culture developed, the number of aqueducts developed, the bringing of water to Rome so that the baths could be used. The waterproof concrete that they developed also allowed them to do more things with pools, and particularly the domes and the ceilings. So it's not just the aqueducts bringing the water in, uh, but you also have these high ceilings and eventually even Roman glass that allows the light of day in. So you have these domes where the uh, moisture and the heat can rise and kind of take away some of the, the steam. And, and that also allows you to control the atmosphere so you can create a really dry room. The Roman Empire reached its height under the rule of Trajan. Many of the great Roman sites scattered across Europe, North Africa and the Middle East date from this era. Sites such as Leptis Magna in Libya, Ephesus in Turkey, Jerash in Jordan, Palmyra in Syria and Arles in France, to name a few. 
These ideas that Rome is bloodthirsty can be seen in increasing depictions of battle and death and the, the gory elements of conquest. And as Rome gets drawn further and further out uh, into the peripheries of empire, what they bring back from the wars is less and less. Figures like Trajan and Marcus Aurelius went out with the army. So in that case, when you're out on campaign for six years, who is administrating in the empire? And what we start to see is without the army to solidify the fringes of empire, uh, we start having revolts, we start seeing lack of security on land and on sea. And that lack of security then leads to uh, economic downfall. After the death of Marcus Aurelius, the empire came under growing pressures as barbarians threatened invasion and wars waged on all sides. A revived Persian Empire threatened in Syria, Egypt and Asia Minor, and the Franks invaded France and Spain. By the 4th century, the Roman Empire was splintering and entering an era of decline. The Emperor Diocletian built a palace not in Rome or even Italy, but here in Split on the shores of the Adriatic in Croatia. Diocletian had introduced major political reform in 286 and separated the eastern and western regions of the empire. In 315, Constantine erected this arch right next to the Colosseum to commemorate his victory over a rival to become emperor. In 324, he introduced Christianity as the state religion, and in 330, moved the capital east to his new city of Constantinople. Why does Constantine leave Rome? On one level, it's a great success that he's able to keep the eastern aspect and create a new capital in the center, but on the other, he's kind of giving up hope by leaving Rome. Also, at this time in very early Christianity, when there was a real polarization between old-school pagan Romans and Christian Romans, that tension is even evident in his monumental victory arch, which I've often thought is the most awkward victory arch. All the other arches that we have commemorate victories over foreign adversaries, where Constantine's arch is really a victory over another Roman candidate set up in front of the Romans. If you go to Constantinople and Byzantium, actually the Roman Eastern Empire carried on for another thousand years. But in the West, we do have the last Roman emperor being deposed by a barbarian um, chieftain who invaded Rome and deposed him. Why did the Roman Empire in the East survive until 1453? And that's the other side of it. How did it survive in the East and collapse in the West, particularly when you're thinking that the Goths, the Huns, they came in and hit the East of the Empire first? Back in Italy, the barbarians gradually moved closer and Rome was sacked in 410. Now that was a huge emotional blow to Rome. The only time Rome had ever, the city of Rome had ever been sacked before was by the Gauls in the 4th century BC. Today, nearly 2,000 years after their ruin, Rome's great sites lie at the heart of many European and Mediterranean cities, gloriously floodlit, reflecting their status as 21st century tourist magnets. But today's great renaissance of Rome cannot disguise the fact that this, one of the first, if not greatest, of empires, would go the way of the many that followed, destroyed by four evils, overspend, arrogance, exploitation, and war. But the legacy remains. The Victory Arch has definitely been one of the most popular things. 
or if you look at the Habsburg Empire in Vienna, um, the whole Hofsburg Palace area has some of the most incredible Roman architecture copies that I've ever seen. And I think that that is another beauty of Roman architecture. They created a visual language to express victory and to express empire in a way that was so effective that a lot of rulers not only sought to harken back to this great period of Rome, but it was a language that people already knew, that they already understood. And when you look at the people who have adopted Roman architecture, Roman military techniques, Roman ideology, whether it's Mussolini or Hitler or Napoleon uh, or Charlemagne, they've done something similar. They've taken a Roman idea and they've put their own spin on it. I think that the Roman Empire rates as one of the greatest empires ever in terms of the sheer amount of territory that it conquered and controlled, but also in the way in which Roman culture spread. If you consider that the Latin language came to be spoken from North Africa through to Britain, that there was a sense in which after AD 211, every inhabitant of the Roman Empire was also a Roman citizen. These are achievements that I don't think can really be paralleled in any other empire. Um, the British Empire is often thought of as modelling itself on the Roman Empire. And certainly, again, you get the spread of cricket, for instance, as a sign of um, the culture of, of Britain spreading around the world. But I don't even think that uh, the British Empire had quite the impact on the culture of its uh, indigenous peoples that uh, the Roman Empire did.